Dr. U.S. soldier Taylor Force was killed by a terrorist in Israel. His parents began a campaign to end the Palestinian government's policy known as pay to slay. They thought they won a major victory in 2018 when the Taylor Force Act became law. Stuart and Robbie Force recently discovered their work isn't finished. CBN News Capitol Hill correspondent Abigail Robertson brings us more on their latest fight. Stewart and Robbie Force are back on Capitol Hill, working to pass legislation that goes further than the Taylor Force Act. They want to close a loophole allowing banks to make payments to terrorists. We've recently come to the realization that the job is half done. And the truth is the payments have continued and those responsible have not been held accountable. After serving tours in both Afghanistan and Iraq, Force's son Taylor was stabbed to death by a Palestinian terrorist in 2016. The family of the Hamas terrorist who murdered Taylor, celebrated as a hero by Hamas, has been receiving martyr payments as a reward for his despicable, despicable act. The new legislation targets banks in the Middle East that continue to process martyr payments. The Taylor Force Martyr Payment Prevention Act would give the Treasury Department the ability to designate these banks as institutions of primary money laundering concern and forbid them from using correspondent accounts in the United States. Currently, the banks avoid sanctions by not keeping an official presence in the United States. To those banks playing this game, your time is up. Senator Lindsey Graham is confident the bill will pass, although Senator Mike Braun tells CBN News he's not so sure. Sadly, it would take some type of miracle to get that across the finish line. Uh, but what it does give any of us is the ability to use the microphone to talk about it because many people probably don't even realize that is happening. While introduced by more than a dozen GOP senators, Braun believes it could be a slow process moving through the Senate, and he's not sure it can pass the House right now. Reporting from Washington, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. This absolutely needs to pass. We need to have the ability to stop this kind of terrorist fu funding. In all the discussion of boycott, divestment, sanction, this is always left out. The Palestinian Authority pays for terrorism. They reward the families of terrorists with monthly payments. Those payments are, are absolutely tied to the severity of the crime. So in other words, the more Jews you kill, the more Israelis you kill, the bigger your payment. It is absolutely despicable. The uh, Trump administration tried to shut this thing down. Uh, in 2018, the Taylor Force Act was passed. U.S. funds are not allowed to go to these payments, and that's one of the uh, just horrors of it, that U.S. taxpayers were funding this. And so the funding to the Palestinian Authority was you, you can't make these payments and expect the U.S. taxpayer to come in and support your budget. You can't expect UNRWA to come in and support your budget. And so the Trump administration moved very strongly to shut it all down. In the face of all that, the Palestinian Authority doubled down. They said, we're going to continue the payments. Uh, so now what can we do? Well, we can go after the banks that facilitate those payments. Uh, I'm, I can't believe the current administration wants to resume payments to the Palestinian Authority, wants to resume payments to UNRWA, wants to re resume literally funding these terrorist acts. We have to stop it. Please encourage your congressman, your senator to pass this bill. Let's get some real teeth into it so we can stop the terrorism that is ongoing in Israel. In other news, the remaining 12 missionary hostages who were abducted in Haiti are now free. John Jessup has that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? That's right, Gordon. The release of the captives comes after two months of negotiating and uncertainty. CBN's Brady Carter brings us the story and a look at just how dangerous the situation still is in Haiti. We glorify God for answered prayer. The remaining 12 hostages are free. Join us in praising God that all 17 of our loved ones are now safe. Thursday's release of the remaining hostages with Christian Aid Ministries comes two months to the day of their abduction. It began when members of the notorious Haitian street gang 400 Mawazo kidnapped the 17 missionaries as they traveled to an orphanage. 
Among those abducted were five children, including an eight-month-old and their Haitian driver. Last month, the gang members released two hostages and three more in early December, all without incident. No details on whether any ransom has been paid. Uh, this was the same gang that kidnapped two of our uh, individuals who work with us. Dr. David Vanderpool is no stranger to violence in Haiti. He left his medical practice in 2010 to serve there for 11 years. He fled Haiti just weeks ago due to growing civil and political unrest. Uh, in 2018, our base manager was murdered by this gang on our front uh, gate steps. And so in front of his wife and child. So in 2015, uh, my wife, uh, they, they attempted to kidnap my wife. She was cut with a machete beaten with a pistol. Since the collapse of Haiti's government, Vanderpool says gangs run roughly 60 percent of the country and kidnappings are up 300 percent. Americans are the main target. Gangs demand hefty ransoms to fuel their violence. Uh, they control all the fuel into the country. Um, they control the ports. The U.S. State Department ranks Haiti as one of the world's most dangerous countries, putting it on the same level as North Korea and Afghanistan. That should be a clue for people that they shouldn't go there. The doctor is now using his time to push Congress and the Haiti caucus to intervene there before the problem spreads. Otherwise, this is going to become a Somalia in our own backyard. Uh, and that should be, uh, should really get people uh, worried because Haiti's very close to the United States. Outside of voicemail updates, Christian Aid Ministries has not made any comment on the kidnapping or release of their missionaries. It remains unclear what led to their freedom. Brody Carter, CBN News. Their return certainly seen as an answer to prayer. Thank you, Brody. Well, here at home, abortion pills will now be available by mail. The Food and Drug Administration has permanently eliminated a longstanding requirement that the pills had to be picked up in person. Agency officials said a scientific review supported broadening access to the medication. The decision is certain to lead to legal challenges and more restrictions in Republican-led states. The FDA had already stopped enforcing the in-person requirement earlier this year because of the pandemic. Well, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention recommending that most Americans should be given the Pfizer or Moderna vaccines instead of the Johnson & Johnson shot because it can cause rare uh, but serious blood clots. More than 200 million Americans are fully vaccinated. Out of about 16 million who have gotten the J&J &J shot, the clotting issue resulted in nine confirmed deaths. Pfizer and Moderna's vaccines don't come with that risk. It's very clear that the mRNA vaccines are just slightly more effective and slightly more safe. The CDC made the decision after new data from safety tracking of vaccinations persuaded the panel. While the blood clots linked to J&J's vaccine remain very rare, they're still occurring, and not just in younger women as originally thought. Meanwhile, the Biden administration is asking the Supreme Court to block orders from multiple lower courts that are preventing the president's vaccine mandates for health care workers from going into effect in about half of the states. The move comes as the military is taking action against personnel for refusing to be vaccinated. The Marine Corps has fired 103 Marines and the Army pulled six leaders out of the service. The Air Force said earlier this week that 27 airmen had been discharged for refusing the vaccine order. The Navy has fired one sailor from his command job for refusing to be tested while he pursues an exemption. It is unclear how many eventually could be discharged from the services. Well, turning now to the tornado disaster in Kentucky, where rebuilding efforts are likely to last for months. More bad weather is slowing the recovery efforts, and CBN's Operation Blessing is in the region helping people recover from the historic tragedy. Charlene Aaron has the story. The tornado outbreak last weekend was the worst in a decade, leaving Kentucky with a long road to recovery. And still more storms struck again the last few days. The deadly weather bringing dangerous tornadoes, rare for December, to the Midwest and Plains, killing five and leaving a path of destruction across the region and more than 400,000 power outages. Those storms came as many people are still working on disaster relief after that series of deadly tornadoes last weekend. At least 90 people were killed across five states, 75 in Kentucky, six in Illinois, four in Tennessee, two in Arkansas, and two in Missouri. Victims ranged in ages from two months old to 98. 
This woman's three-year-old son was killed when their home collapsed on top of them. She had been holding on to him and her one-year-old as they took refuge in the bathroom. I had them both in my arms. I didn't let them go. That's how we were found. Kentucky, the hardest hit state, has a long road of recovery ahead. The devastation is still, I don't know if the right word is profound, traumatic, um, painful. You know, we here in Kentucky have felt uh, the love and support of the entire country and of the entire world. There's a ton of work that needs to be done. I've been doing this for 14 years all over the country, and it's hard to get much worse than this. It's a little unsettling, to be honest, because it's everywhere you look where this tornado went through, it did catastrophic damage. CBN's Operation Blessing is in Kentucky and Tennessee, providing much needed aid and support, working with church partners to deliver food, water and other necessities. They'll be receiving those supplies of food, Home Depot buckets that are filled with cleaning supplies and other things that will assist the people of this community to begin the process of recovery. Operation Blessing teams are preparing to stay for the long haul as residents work to rebuild their communities and their lives. And it's our plan over the next weeks to continue to search for those who may have been forgotten, may have been overlooked, so that they don't feel like they're unimportant. With the devastation so widespread, Operation Blessing is working to bring more help to the region in the days ahead. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Thanks, Charlene. Gordon, what you kept hearing in that story was that these people who've been affected by that tornado are going to need help for quite some time. It's going to be a long road of recovery, and Operation Blessing is being very intentional. We're trying to target the underserved communities, uh, the ones that don't have yet uh, major relief efforts. And it's amazing. Right here in the United States of America, people are without food and without water in these devastated areas. Uh, no power. Uh, you know, how do you get through the winter months? All of these things are just crushing down upon them, and we want to be there for them in their time of need. If you want to be part of the, the help, if you want to be part of the solution here, um, just say, I, I want to give. I want to be a part of it. Uh, there's a lot of different ways. You can write to us, Disaster Relief Fund, CBN Center, Virginia Beach, Virginia, 23463. Just put Disaster Relief on the memo line or the check. You can text us. We now have a text to give. OBDR to 71777, or you can go to CBN.com on the giving page. There's a place where you can designate your gift to Operation Blessing Disaster Relief. Whichever way, be a part of it. Be a part of helping people in need. Do it right now. 1-800-700-7000. Reaching a billion people. That's the goal for The Chosen, the first TV series about the life of Jesus. Over 300 million people have already seen it in 50 languages languages, and now it's premiering in France. George Thomas brings us that story from Paris. The experience of playing was just made me want to be more like him. Walking along Paris's famed Champs-Élysées this week, actor Jonathan Rumi. I have something that's open to all people. Get up and walk. If he was supposed to be healed, God would have done it himself. That's an interesting point. Who plays Jesus the in the television the series, The Chosen. You have certainly livened things up around here. World travels fast. Tell CBN News that he's humbled by how God is using the show to touch millions of people around the world. Do you often pinch yourself, realizing the magnitude of the role that you're playing and how well the show has done? I don't know if I pinched myself. I, I more bow my head to the ground because I never feel that I'm worthy of the things that are happening as a result. Je suis vraiment navré, mais je, je ne sais même pas ton nom. Je suis Jésus. Three years after its premiere episode, the series now hits television screens for the first time across France, airing on one of this country's top TV channels. To be on a major network is a first. Um, we love our platform. We love having a free app that's available in, to the whole world. But to be embraced by Canal Plus has been such an honor. Rumi and cast members joined some 500 people for a showing of The Chosen at this Paris movie theater ahead of next week's broadcast. Many watching it for the first time.
the intimacy between the disciple and Jesus is uh, like a, a like very intimate. Image. It was di different from another other uh, films about Jesus. It was just fantastic, I can say. I make a way for people to access that kingdom. The Chosen is the first ever multi-season TV show about the life of Jesus. And even though it's free to watch on their app, fans have given more than $40 million towards the production budget, making it the largest crowd-funded media venture in entertainment history. 16 episodes of The Chosen have so far been translated into 50 languages. And as of today's taping, more than 321 million people around the world have watched the television series. Angel Studios, which handles distribution, plans to dub the series in the top 25 languages that are spoken in the world, with hopes of initially reaching a billion people. We can't reach a billion in just in English. <laughs> uh, so to reach a billion people, we have to unlock more languages. Eric Sellerier, one of France's prominent evangelicals, is praying the show will unlock hearts and minds of his countrymen. My hope is that people will connect not with the show, but with, with Jesus through the characters in the show. Salarier has mobilized hundreds of French pastors and Catholic leaders to hold follow-up ministry and discipleship programs over the course of the chosen seven-season broadcast. An additional 3,500 Christians have volunteered to hold small groups in their homes and other locations to discuss the series. We are preparing the fields, we are preparing the arts with season one, but I, I hope that season after season, people will connect more and more with Jesus. Well, I mean, I think- That's Rumi's prayer as well, posting on Instagram that he believes God is tilling the soil and sowing seeds for a fertile revival. Is that- what you hope will happen as a result of the showing of The Chosen? Yeah, I mean, I think it's already happening, and I think we're an additional element of that story. I'm just honored to be a part of it. George Thomas, CBN News, Paris. Well, I absolutely rejoice over this. I was talking with staff members from CBN International about uh, how wonderful it was. Here they are. They're on Canal Plus, which is one of the major networks in Europe. Uh, what an absolute breakthrough to get a series on the life of Jesus uh, and to broadcast it in French, uh, uh, expertly dubbed. Well, what a wonderful breakthrough. What an incredible thing. And then this huge goal. Let's have a billion people watch it. And in order to reach that goal, we need a lot more languages than English. Isn't it incredible? It's just absolutely a cause for a big hallelujah to everyone behind the chosen. Uh, you go and, and keep preaching the good news. Keep showing the stories of the Bible. Terry? Earlier this year, Kentucky diver Chase Lane was named the SEC Conference's Men's Swimming and Diving Scholar Athlete of the Year. He also earned All-American honors by the NCAA. He even competed at the Olympic qualifiers. And yet, if Chase had his way, none of this would have happened, because a few years ago, he was in a dark place and planning to end his life. I remember telling one of my roommates at the time, I was like, I, I truly believe that everybody would be happier if I was gone. And all I could do was look over the ledge there and be like, there's an night I'm gonna do it. That night, Chase Lane's life changed forever. He had all the accolades and promise a young athlete could hope for, yet Chase wanted to take his own life. In high school, he was a highly recruited diver, holding offers from some of the country's best schools. His mother, a Christian, had some strong advice about his college choice. Some words she said were, uh, I want you to go to a place that I know that coach will take care of you no matter what happens. Chase accepted a scholarship from the University of Kentucky, and his excitement was at an all-time high. I'm like, let's go. Uh, so I was super excited off the get-go. However, his enthusiasm was short-lived, as the responsibilities of being a student athlete quickly took their toll. I got very overwhelmed. My schedule, I was taking 18 credits, and of course, the swimming and diving schedule was just wild. and waking up early in the morning. 
Um, and then you don't get home until, gosh, like 10 after the tutors and everything, and then you're doing homework, taking a shower, trying to eat. Um, got very overwhelmed. So everything at the time I was doing was very anxiety provoking. Kentucky diving coach Ted Hata, a Christian, noticed that the freshman was struggling. I could see something in him. His walk and his demeanor just started to hunch over. And he was dark and he was shuffling and he was limping a little bit and something happened. And he said that I'm in a dark spot right now. He got lost. And so that anxiety heightened and I became very, very depressed. But it was very relevant to my teammates and my peers, my coaches, my mentors at the time that something was not right. In spite of his depression, Chase continued to succeed In as a diver. And watch out because he's only gonna hit that. Still, no amount of success made things better. In March of 2018, at the NCAA's Swimming and Diving Championships, Chase decided to end it all. I couldn't take it anymore. And all I could do was look over the ledge there and be like, this is the night I'm gonna do it. I knew he was in a dark spot, but I didn't know, you know, you just don't know how, I didn't know how serious it was. Two things happened. Chase tweeted, I wish everything was over. He also called his mother to tell her goodbye. I told her, Mom, like, thank you for everything you ever did for me. I love you. Um, but I think there's no purpose for me in this world. Um, I can't do this anymore. Like, life is just, it's frustrating. Um, there's no reason for me to be on this earth if I have no purpose. And I hung up. Chase's mother called Coach Ted. The coach realized the urgency and quickly reached out to Chase. Coach Ted opened the Bible with Chase and shared God's love for him. Matthew 6, 25. Jesus talking about the look at the birds of the air. They, they neither reap nor sow. Um, they don't stow away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. You know, if God so cares for the birds of the air and the lilies of the field, won't he care more for you? Chase was being cared for at college, just like his mother had hoped. So this whole Kentucky family that I had was like a father-son duo. And he prayed for me in that room. Dude, like the whole night I was up. But he was a prayer warrior for me in that moment. That brought me down on my knees and hands and really confessed that Jesus is Lord and that I needed a relationship with Jesus in order to move forward in my life. He committed to reading God's word on his own and he joined a small group. After I dissected those gospels, I quickly learned that it was a relationship with Christ that I was missing. And I could find hope in that just like anybody can. Because he died on that cross just for us. That was uh, very eye-opening to me of what I was missing. I was like, I need that. I was hungry for it. Today, Chase is a diving coach and a physical therapist. His desire is to help those struggling with anxiety and depression by sharing the good news he found in a relationship with Jesus Christ. There's hope in Jesus. Uh, it's plain and simple. There's hope in Jesus. He died on that cross for us. Um, there's no greater suffering that you will ever go through, me or you, we will ever go through, or anybody out there, than he did on that cross. There's also no greater victory. I don't believe that depression and anxiety belongs to anybody's life. Um, we are not promised a spirit of fear. We're promised a spirit of peace. Um, and so that peace, once you find that, you can live your life with frustration and all that stuff, like everything that's going on in the world. But there's a peace that you can find within all of that, and that's in Jesus. You know, Chase was in a Christian family. He grew up knowing the Lord. He grew up with faith in his heart. Life happens. And, you know, sometimes, especially for people who are believers, things that are overwhelming kind of catch up on you a little bit at a time, and pretty soon you're overwhelmed. And often, in as in Chase's scenario, you know, you're getting some victory and other things in your life and you're doing well and the crowd is applauding and the success is there and so is the emptiness. You know, you can't control the circumstances around you, but we can control what goes into us. You know, what's that old adage, you know, all the water in the world won't sink a ship unless it gets inside. 
Well, you and I are the only ones who can control that. I look at Chase's scenario and I think, wouldn't it have been a tremendous loss, not just for his family, but for all God's kingdom purposes for him if he had taken his own life? Everything would have come to a halt, to an end. But in Christ, there is new beginning. There is start over. You know, some of you may be dealing with depression. I, I run into more and more family and friends that struggle with this issue, and it's real. It's very real. I don't know why there seems to be so much of it today. You know, the world is a bit of a crazy place, and sometimes, sometimes, you know, we get caught up in all those side things, like, like Chase talked about, you know, from early morning till late at night, the practices, and then there's the studying and the expectation of people, and your own expectation of yourself. And it all becomes so overwhelming. But you know what happens along the way? Little by little by little, it pulls you away from the one who gives meaning to your life, from the one who created you intentionally with purpose. There are things you're to do here, things you're to accomplish. If you struggle with the darkness of depression, I urge you to get medical help for that. There are things you can take that will help to enhance what your body needs to rise above that, to have victory over that. But beyond that, Chase did all the right things. After that coach reached out to him, he got into the Word of God. He received the prayer that was prayed over him. He realized that he had strayed from the one who loved him, the one who had purpose for his life, the one who knew him before he was formed in his mother's womb. Maybe that's you today. Maybe you've strayed away from what you've always known to be true. You know, there's a lot of confusion confronting people in the world today. Go back to the Father heart of God. You know, he's waiting for you, and I love that, that he's the good shepherd, and it says he leaves the 99 to go after the one who's lost. If that's you today, turn around and meet Jesus. He's right there. He's waiting for you. He loves you. You get a fresh beginning with him, a start over. You need to know that your life matters, that you are deeply loved, that you are created by a father who sees you as his child and with great love and intention for your life. Invite him into your heart. Even if you've done it before, if you need to start over, just say, Jesus, I've strayed, I've walked away. I've been caught up in all the junk that the world offers around me, even if it's just the noise of the world. God, I, I'm coming back home to your heart. Will you come into mine? Will you be the Lord of my life, the savior of my soul? Forgive me, forgive me, and fill me with power and strength. Open up your word to me so I can know truth. I'm asking you for hope. I'm asking you to change my life. Pray, pray. It's just conversation with God. And if you need to pray with someone, our prayer line is always open. It's right there on your screen, 1-800-700-7000. Someone's waiting to hear from you today. So call, you can call anonymously, but come back to the heart of God. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. The City of Philadelphia School District has started a new policy allowing students to decide how they want their gender to be identified without needing their parents' permission. Each child can now fill out a form and specify if they prefer to be called male, female, or non-binary. The option will then be used in all school correspondence like report cards and district records. New York City and Los Angeles schools already have similar policies in place. Critics argue children's minds are not fully developed and need guidance from parents for major life-altering choices. Well, in addition to the important work assisting people hit by the tornadoes in Kentucky and other Midwestern states, CBN's Operation Blessing is also training people around the world to help those in need, including improving their health. In Honduras, many families live in remote communities with no health clinics nearby. So people who live in places like Copan must travel long distances for care if they can afford to. And even then, the services often will be too expensive for them. 
But Operation Blessing has a community health volunteers program that trains local residents in basic health care practices. Their teams hosted a clinic in Copan, establishing an action plan for children under five to improve their well-being, which will help the community overall stay healthier for years to come. Well, to learn more about Operation Blessing, simply go to OB.org. Well, after Stephanie Miranda lost her job, she then had to go hunt for loose change just to buy food. Then her husband, Sergio, lost his overtime pay, and he didn't have enough money for gasoline. Bills piled up, the couple had to short sale their house, and still they didn't stay down for long. Well, here's how they made an amazing comeback. We didn't have enough to gas up the car, not being able to buy milk. And Stephanie, a few times, found herself in the store looking if she could find loose change down the aisles to see if we could get that next piece of bread. That's what happened to the Mirandas when Stephanie lost her job and Sergio lost his overtime. I just felt ashamed of not being able to provide for my family. Meanwhile, Stephanie racked up some hefty medical bills and the couple ended up with $25,000 of debt. They deferred mortgage payments for as long as they could, but ultimately had to short sale their home. It was really hard to the point we were crying and on our knees. The Mirandas are Christians and had been giving at church for years. The Word of God says in Psalms 24, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Tithing is very important to God because it shows Him that you trust in Him. So even though it was hard, they kept giving during these tough times. I wanted us and He wanted us to be obedient Soon, Sergio got a 20% raise. He says, I can't explain it. And I said, I believe the Lord blessed us because we've been so faithful in our tithing. Shortly after that, he got another promotion, this time with a 40% raise. Financially, it set us up way above, and we were able to just wipe out the rest of the debt that we had and it's been great ever since. Today, Sergio makes enough money that Stephanie doesn't have to work. And since they've paid down their debt, they once again own their own home. And now, they give on top of their tithe to CBN. We saw that they genuinely had a heart for God's people and to be able to help. And that touches my heart more than anything. Whenever there's a storm or some natural disaster that happens, 700 Club is on the ground assisting people, and that's what it's all about. The Mirandas enjoy sharing the resources God has given them, and they encourage others with money struggles to try giving as well. If you really want to see change, definitely tie. Trust God. Hand them your finances. You give that back to Him, and He'll just blow your mind. He wants to do that. He wants to bless you. What is he waiting for? He's waiting for you to give. It's one of the great principles. My father taught it to me long ago, and, and it was part of his wonderful book, Secret Kingdom. It's the law of reciprocity, where you give, and it will be given back to you. And then the measure you use determines the measure that will be measured back to you. So you can achieve 30, 60, 100-fold increase all because of your generosity. Uh, and, and when you do it cheerfully and you do it um, with joy, uh, not from a sense of obligation, but because you want to, you want to help other people, well, then wonderful things will happen. God will open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that you can't contain. If you want to get in on this, all you have to do is call us, 1-800-700-7000. Just say, I want to be a member of the 700 Club. When disasters strike, I want to strike back with love and compassion. When people are in need, I want to be able to there, be there to help them. When I, I see the world in its condition today, I want to preach the gospel around the world. 
You're doing all of that when you're a member of the 700 Club. So if you're not a member, call us, 1-800-700-7000. Just say, I want to join. If you are a member, consider increasing. We have other club levels. There's 700 Club at $20 a month, 700 Club Gold at $40 a month. 1,000 Club is $1,000 a year, and that breaks out to $84 a month. At whatever level, call now. When you call and pledge, I've got something for you. It's called The Nearness of Heaven. It's a wonderful DVD. You can also get streaming um, of stories of people who've died, gone to heaven, then come back to tell us what heaven is like, and then encourage us that we can have that experience in the here and now. We don't have to wait. The kingdom of heaven is at hand, and you can pray that God's will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. I want you to have it. It's yours when you join. 1-800-700-7000. When Kurt Snyder was 20 years old, he went to bed with a pounding headache. Hours later, he woke up in what he called a heightened state of awareness. And there he saw Jesus on the cross and a red light beaming down from heaven. The experience only lasted for a few seconds, and yet it changed his life forever. Messianic rabbi Kurt Snyder made news in 2019. He asked people in Times Square to respond to questions like, why am I here, and is this all there is? Schneider was raised in a devoutly Jewish family and met Jesus in a vision when he was 20. His shocked parents hired a deep programmer and a psychiatrist to attempt to set their son straight. In his latest book, Call to Breakthrough, Rabbi Schneider shares how he found his life purpose, despite great personal cost, in proclaiming the Jewish Jesus. Well, Rabbi Kurt Snyder joins us now via Skype, and Rabbi, welcome to the show. Shalom, my brother. God bless you, and thank you so much for having me, Gordon. All right. Thanks for joining us. Uh, you grew up a nice Jewish boy. At the same time, you're, you're reading about uh, Indian gurus. So why, why were you doing that? What were you looking for? Well, I was entering, uh, I had a huge identity crisis when I was 18 years old. I wrestled all through school. I started in seventh grade, Gordon, and every year that I aged, I became more and more committed to the sport. So I became like a professional athlete. I trained all year long, and that's who I was in my identity. I was Kurt Schneider, the wrestler. I lived it, ate it, drank it, slept it. It was my universe. And when I walked off the wrestling mat after wrestling my last match in high school, although I had a small scholarship to wrestle at college at the University of Tampa, I realized that the world that I was entering into now as an adult was much bigger than the world that I lived in up through my last match in high school. Suddenly I went from feeling like I was in control because my, uh, my, my world was people that wrestled my weight class. And in that environment, I felt in control. But when I recognized that I was entering as an adult now into the wider world and that I wasn't in control, I didn't know who I was anymore. And uh, that's why I was searching. And that's why I was searching for an answer in, in, in reading about an Indian guru. All right. Well, you then had a profound encounter uh, could you tell us about that? What, what did you experience? Well, I was in the middle of reading this book, Gordon, called Autobiography of a Yogi by Paramount Yogananda. And there were pictures in the book of this guy supposedly levitating off the ground. And I always believed in God. I said, God, if that's real, if this guy can really levitate off the ground, that's what I want to do with my life. I found my new wrestling. I found my new goal. So right in the middle of this, I went to sleep. It was a hot August night. 1978. Keep in mind, no one had ever witnessed to me about Jesus. I had never read the New Testament. I'm a Jew. Jesus was not something I was attracted to at all. He was as far away to me as the man on the moon. But in that hot August night of 1978, the Lord awoke me from my sleep. Suddenly, I was aware that I was aware, and Jesus appeared to me in a vision. It was in color. Jesus was on the cross. As an American, Gordon, I knew enough to know the person on the cross was Yeshua or Jesus. There were people in the distance looking at him, and then all of a sudden, a ray of red light from straight through the sky beamed down on Jesus' head. And when I saw that ray of red light come down on his head, I knew the light was coming from God. I understood the symbolism and that the Lord was showing me that Jesus was the way to him. Um, a lot of people might have dismissed that, so uh, I've, I have a 
uh, saying that, you know, the dreams that come from God, you don't have them, they have you. What was it about this experience that so gripped you? Well, that's a good question. I guess there's a scripture that says, in the day of God's power, man is made will, uh, willing. It was just something that when it happened, I just instantly knew that God was alive, that he was real, that he loved me, that he had a plan and destiny for my life, and I never questioned it. Beyond that, I had several other very, very strong, dramatic, supernatural encounters over those next three years. So that if I could have doubted the first experience, the second experience and the third experience I had, I could have never doubted because they were more than visions and even more than dreams. So uh, the second experience I had, I would simply say this, if anybody saw what I saw, and what I saw was the Lord allowed me to see into the spirit world one night. It wasn't like I saw something like spirit. The Lord literally allowed me to see spirit. And I would say to anybody, if you saw what I saw, you would say what I'm saying. It was beyond anything that the human mind could have fabricated or created. I knew that what I saw was the reality of the dimension of what I was living in the nature of life. So God confirmed the first experience, my, my salvation experience, by following it up with subsequent supernatural encounters. Well, your parents didn't receive this news with joy. Uh, they, they actually tried to deprogram you, and then they put you into a psychiatric ward. Uh, so uh, how did you make it through all of that? Did you ever feel that, you know, you made a mistake by letting people know? I never did. And, and what's interesting about it, Gordon, all these years later, now I look at it and I think, I can't believe I wasn't mad at my parents. But I wasn't even mad at my parents at the time. I, I, don't, I can't explain it. I, I just kind of went along with the process. The first thing they did was they hired the most famous deprogrammer in the country, Ted Patrick. You could search him online. He was actually arrested at one point for uh, kidnapping children. By children, I mean he was being hired by parents to um, get their children out of believing, for example, in the Hare Krishna movement or whatever. But he was abducting them. That's what happened to me. My dad told me that we were going to talk to somebody about buying a restaurant. And when we went to the business meeting, it wasn't a business meeting. It was Ted Patrick and his two, uh, you know, assistants that were young guys, you know, over six feet tall, over 200 pounds. They literally abducted me and then took me from Cleveland, Ohio to California, where they had their rehabilitation home set up. They kept me there for a little over two weeks, took me to the bars in the uh, night and the beach in the day. <clears throat> and I guess they thought that if they could just get me away from whoever they felt was programming me, I'd snap back out of it and come to my senses. But obviously, uh, that wasn't going to work because Jesus was the one that had, that had come to me. They're, they're playing the music. We could talk for a long time. I, if you want your breakthrough, you can find out more in Rabbi Snyder's story. It's in his brand new autobiography. It's called Breakthrough. It's available nationwide. We leave you these words from Ephesians. Because of Christ and our faith in Him, we can now come boldly and confidently into God's presence.